It's good to get into the Word after singing such great words. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Ready to go a little bit? Luke chapter number 15, if you wouldn't mind joining me there. Oh, powerful words and song, singing of our Redeemer, singing of the one that we're going to preach about. Again, you can't miss when you have the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel. That's simply what it means, the good news. And so here we are in Luke chapter number 15. We're making progress as we make hope known. And uh, again, Jesus Christ has always been the one that sets our example, gives us our model, gives us our way to go. And, and as songs are written, they're written, the best ones are written to the glory of God in the name of Jesus Christ. They, those are the ones that we love to sing about his redemption saying of what he has done to give, again, glory to his name and to save our souls. I, I just, uh, I often have this vision in uh, my heart and mind and thought with the Lord as uh, I study scripture, especially the gospels, that our church, our church family, the body of Christ in this local church would uh, be that uh, recognized place um, in Blue Springs, in this community, in the area that a lost coin can be found, a lost sheep can be found, a lost son that wandered and walked away from his father can find the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we, we're going to preach toward that end. It's our scripture today, once again, in Luke 15. Uh, Dwayne mentioned real quick, I've got my... Uh, ADP Sports Charity Golf Tournament shirt on from a few years back, just reminding us that we have a little bit of a tournament tomorrow morning, and my hope is that everyone that comes as part of it that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ or does know the Lord Jesus Christ, that they are reminded of why we're there and how we give glory to God. We're part of a regional mission work of raising funds for you know, a wonderful and worthy cause, uh, scholarships for young children that desire to go to Plaza Heights Christian Academy. It'll be the second year that we have done that, and we're looking forward to seeing how that all turns out once again. And again, very thankful to First Bible Baptist Church, all of you that jump in and are part of it. Thank you for volunteer. We have tons of volunteers, uh, maybe more than we need, but we'll take them, and everybody that comes will have something for them to do. Thank you for all the people that signed up to play golf and took time away from work. And... Uh, are going to be part of a very special, special day. So thankful. Uh, yay, Honduras mission trip team. Thank you for coming back. <laughs> no, we've been obviously praying for them, and it's good to hear. Um, Dwayne mentioning that uh, over 500 people got saved. Praise the Lord. And Jose, pay, they doing well? I bet there was lots of tears and smiles and amen. A precious church planting family in Honduras and uh, very, very thankful for them and our opportunity to continue to partner in the kingdom of God work, seeing as souls get saved. Bobby and Becky, thank you. Okay, you came back. We praise the Lord. There's a few, there's a few people that are very thankful that Becky is back. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I'm Bobby too. But <laughs> we're very thankful, all of us, very, very thankful. Great time. Incredible things happen. I know you shared a little bit of that. Did you speak in investors today? A little bit? Did you do okay? Did you do it? Marty, you do okay? Okay, praise the Lord. He's starting to get pretty good, you know, preaching for 45 years. He's starting to, well, praise the Lord for the international mission flavor of our church and our desire to be an Acts 1 8 church, also regional missions, to be able to reach out in this community corporately and collectively as a local church. And of course, there's part of all of us individually in that responsibility as well. Today's message really is going to head toward us as a church collectively. Here we are in a, a well-known passage of Scripture in Luke chapter number 15. It holds in it to me um, one of everybody's, most every Christian's favorites of the parables uh, when it comes to the parable of the prodigal son. And there's so much here. We're going to cover 10 verses today. Uh, some look at this as being three separate parables. I'm going to look at the first two of them, and then we'll look at the third one. I look at this also, as many others do, that it's just one big parable about 
lost, the lost, someone being lost, and how God sent his son, Jesus Christ, and how God has this, God the Father has this incredible compassion for his creation, for mankind to come to know salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this passage of scripture here, the first 10 verses, lead us into, uh, of course, the last uh, 20 something verses and so I just named this pictures of joy and uh, reading through and studying through the last number of days that just kept on coming back to me it could be three pictures of joy or pictures of joy just then pictures of joy and it's part one and we again we're going to cover just the first 11 verses 1 through 10 and look at how Jesus Christ gives an answer to these people that have said to him hey how is it that you hang out with publicans and sinners? What is the matter with you? Because the Pharisees and scribes, they murmured. And they were bothered by him accompanying with these sinners, with these awful people that didn't deserve the self-righteousness. And again, they don't want that self-righteousness that those religious Pharisees really truly carried in themselves. Over 30 years ago, I uh, hailed out at First Bible Baptist Church in Rochester. At that time, George Grace is the pastor, and I've obviously mentioned that a number of times, and George has been here. He's a great friend of this ministry and for many different reasons. Years ago, he used to hand out, uh, put a handout out to everybody, and uh, he would, you know, he was doing different series and things like that, and I, I saved a number of them. Um, so this has got to be early 90s, I would say. Now this is a, he was doing a series on the parables of Jesus, this is number eight. He's done the parables of the unjust steward and parables of the good Samaritan. This one covers chapter number 15. Now, this is double-sided, six pages of notes. How long do you think he preached back then? <laughs> He'd haul the mail for 70 minutes, easy. And so I'm going to cover this all in 75 minutes today. I think I can narrow that down. No, I just wanted to just highlight something as an introduction to what I just said and how he actually wrote it in these notes. I love the way it's written. Each one of the parables concern themselves over something lost and joy at the recovery of that which is lost. The sheep, the coin, the son were all lost and all worth saving. By the way, are people worth saving to you? I'm not talking corporately collectively as a church when people come to first bible do they know that we care enough about them that their soul is paramount that being lost like a sheep or a coin or the sun we actually are going to dig in and care to the point of saying we want to be the intermediator Jesus, of course, is the mediator. But we want to be that ambassador of reconciliation to introduce you to the Lord Jesus Christ so your relationship can be reconciled. He continued on by saying this. The sheep was lost and likely knew it. Because of his curiosity, he strayed. Kind of sounds like all of us. All we like sheep have gone astray. Seeing a gap in the hedge, he wandered from the rest and ultimately drifted aimlessly. The sheep represents the foolish unthinking individual that wanders from God. Happily, this sheep was overtaken by the seeking shepherd. Let me read another little piece of this to reference the coin, and so you kind of get a backdrop as we read the scripture. The coin was lost, but being without life had no consciousness or sensation of being lost. Further, its lost condition evoked neither discomfort nor anxiety. The coin was lost either because it was badly handled or unconsciously dropped. Here we have symbolized the lost sinner who is largely ignorant of his standing before God. The coin remains stationary until found where it was dropped. That's what we're going to talk about today in these first few verses of Luke chapter number 15. Let's read it together. Join with me. In verse number one, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, Here's the picture. 
Here's one of the pictures. He's picturing joy eventually through this picture map, this beautiful, beautiful accounting of Jesus Christ and how much he cares. Verse 4, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Verse 8 through 10. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it, and when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Now, Father in heaven, thank you for your scripture this morning. Once again, our gratitude overflows for who you are and being able to read the living word of God. Thank you, Jesus, for being our salvation, for being the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no man that can come to the Father but by you. Jesus, thank you. We praise you. We say hallelujah to you. Praise ye the Lord. I pray for this congregation of saints right here. You've brought them together. There's no coincidences. Everybody here could be somewhere else, but they're here. And we want to hear from you. We desire to be stirred to be awakened maybe, to be shaken a bit. And as a church, my prayer is, as a shepherd here, as a pastor here, that God, uh, we collectively will be a community of gospel givers that shepherd people to be saved, which were lost. I pray for each individual here. Speak, work, do the work that only you can do, do by your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. These pictures of joy that come out of here, to me, have so much to do with us reading about and reading the manner, the attitude, the approach of Jesus Christ. I wonder if we just read through the Gospels the same way all the time. Well, I think that it would be good, it behoove us all to read the Gospels, say, the next time you read them all, say, how is Jesus interacting with the audience? How is Jesus speaking to the disciples? What is Jesus saying in any particular setting, and why is he saying it, and who is he saying it to? The audience that followed Jesus was told to attend to his challenge. He made it clear what it would cost anyone who desired to be a disciple. Remember last week, we looked at chapter number 14, the last few verses of what it meant to be his disciple. Verses 25 down through the end of the chapter, verse number 35, and we see the, the part of the verse in verse number 35 up on the screen. It says, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. We know that that statement has been made by Jesus Christ more than once in his parabolic teaching. Jesus Christ has told them, hey, disciples, this is what it means. If you want to be my disciple, you cannot be my disciple unless you hate your father, mother, wife, children, brother, sisters. Hey, you need to have me first. Your own life cannot be above me. If it is, then you cannot be my disciple. It's going to cost you something. And of course, at the end of chapter number 14, we saw his conclusion. He made it clear. Now there's a different setting of people. There's different people that are listening to him, though the disciples are around, as we know, very close by. You see, Luke 15, I mentioned it earlier, is heralded for the salvation message of Jesus Christ to pursue that which is lost. We just sung a tremendous song about that. 
and we sung a couple songs about my Redeemer. We, we, we really were singing earlier about exactly what this message is all about. But now, again, I want to just kind of move it to us collectively, to look around the room to each other, to the body of Christ. Are we doing the kingdom of God work together? Would somebody come in here and say, hey, I've been received well, I'm lost, I don't know what I'm doing. At whatever gathering, is it Tuesday afternoon at 3 o'clock and someone came up and I saw that you're a church up on the hill and I was just compelled, I don't know why, to come up and say hi. What am I going to do at that moment? What are we, whoever's in the building at that moment, going to do? Are we in a place where we can be used by God who is pursuing people to come to know his son, the Lord Jesus Christ? We need to grasp the words, the terminology of Jesus. You and I were reconciled to God through him, and now here we are going, okay, who can we direct to Jesus so that he can save their soul. You see, the persistent pursuit by Jesus, the Son of Man, to seek and to save that which was lost was in deep contrast to man's cold, contrast to man's cold heart toward people being saved. You say, well, Pastor, you've kind of used this terminology a few times. Well, Jesus Christ is doing it. We're going through chapter by chapter, verse by verse, passage by passage, scripture by scripture, and we're seeing that Jesus Christ is laying something down in frequency in Luke's gospel, he is directing the message of Jesus the Savior to these Pharisees, these Sadducees, these scribes. But he is speaking to a lot of Gentiles, too. He's speaking to a lot of lost Greeks and Romans, barbarians. You see, Pharisees, scribes, and religious people, they did not care enough to search, find, and rescue that which is lost. They just didn't care much. It's scary that at that point in time, 2,000 years ago, we have an accounting of the way that we can be 2,000 years later. We're the church. We've been ordained by God to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to do the work and carry out the work of the Acts 1-8 mission of our church, the Acts 2 project of the vision that God has called us to, to live faith, love others, and declare hope. Not just suggest it, but to declare this hope. Charles Spurgeon said this, the three parables recorded in this chapter are not repetitions. I mentioned a little bit about this. I just want to read a quote by him. They all declare the same main truth, but each one reveals a different phase of it. The three parables are three sides of a pyramid of doct gospel doctrine, but there is a different inscription on each. When combined, they present us with a far more complete exposition of their doctrine than could have been conveyed by any one of them. I see it that way, again, that this is really, truly 32 verses of Jesus Christ teaching a parable. And all those people right there, maybe some are looking at the other person. Some of them are looking at themselves. Some of them, again, are concerned about their healing of a physical malady. And here we have the disciples. So I throw this out to you, believers, followers of Jesus, people that are wrestling with whether or not I want to pay the cost to follow Jesus as his disciple or just be in the program, to be part of what he's doing. Do I want to be that conduit of God? Because again, it says up on the screen our theme verse, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, great job, Jesus. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you for saving me. But it goes back to what does he want to do through his church? What message are we to have collectively as his church? First Bible Baptist Church. So I was out visiting the grandchildren the other day, and then someone came by and was talking to my daughter about something that... Uh, to sell her something or whatever, just walking through, and your daughter said that you're a pastor or whatever, you're a priest or Catholic. I said, well, I'm a Baptist pastor, a Baptist preacher. Hey, that's a good, that, that's good, that's good. That's, you know, that's, you know, I didn't want to, but my point is this. You can say an awful lot. You can act an awful lot of ways. You can do or say some things. That person was talking to my daughter 
But at that point, it's not a matter of backpedaling. It's a matter of saying, well, where do you pastor? Well, I pastor at a Baptist church. I have the opportunity to preach the Bible, have an opportunity to lead people and shepherd people that are the most precious people in the world. And to me, at that point, it's like any one of us. Do I represent the Lord Jesus Christ? Do I represent his church well? Do I represent the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Am I really a representative of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, Jesus was surrounded by a crowd of people here. They were described as publicans and sinners. The publicans were tax collectors who were often criticized and ostracized in their Jewish community. Why? Because they loved to steal from their own people to favor the Roman Empire they were working for. This just serves for you and me as a reminder that Jesus Christ had no problem being around publicans and sinners. He was not repulsed by them, are we? Do we go out looking for sinners so that we can get involved in sin? That would be an awful place to be in our carnality. Or do we realize as God's church that we're to be in company of publicans and sinners so that we can give them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ just like Jesus did. It's a reminder that Jesus was never repulsed by sinners. Again, he in this society, in this setting, and where he was at, he was looked at as the outcast by those who were the Pharisees and the scribes, and yet those outcasts that were sinners, he had no problem accompanying and being in company with them. These pictures of joy, I want you to see again that as the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, and I would say both of them are lost sons in a lot of ways, send us a message today. And I'd like to approach it as a group not just one individual person that needs to straighten this whole thing out, but as a church, would you enjoy the joy, the rejoicing of people getting saved? Would you be part and desire to be part? Would we as a church see more people baptized because they got saved? It was neat to be at the primed summer camp celebration and hear the testimony of four young people. They got saved and they wanted to be baptized. To me, we are in that place of the, hey, someone's lost, I'm gonna go find them, and then I'm gonna rejoice when they're saved. To seek and to save, to search and to rescue, to be like those first responders. But I throw, that out, I'll throw this out at you. As we look in our three simple lesson points today, is it possible that as the first responders for Jesus Christ with the gospel, as a church, when we get brought into doing something for the cause of Christ, do we find ourselves maybe tired and worn out, bothered by those that might not want to be found so they remain lost? Those that hear the message but reject it. People say, hey, I just want to come to your church to get something from you. And we say, we just want you to know Jesus Christ. We want you to learn of Christ. We want you to no longer be a lost sheep, a lost coin. We would love for you in the pictures that Jesus Christ painted to know that he will give you life and give you life more abundantly. Back to what Jesus Christ is showing us our first thing, search, find, and rescue. Do we adore or do we abhor? Remember, last week's message was very individual, one-on-one. -on -one. This is as a group. Do we adore or abhor? Do we really love deeply or not love so very much and abhor? Does the church respond as gospel givers to sinners who are lost in life and need to be found? I'm just asking you, how do you see your church? 
How do we view us together in this community that we're in? Look around, you can. Wonder if anybody's picking up the, the daily responsibility. Hope somebody's doing it to represent our church. I hope you, Pastor. I mean, we pay you a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. I hope you're doing your part. You didn't know you were paying me that much, did you? I'm just kidding. I drive a 2003 Honda. Come on. Praise the Lord. I am spoiled, and you are good to me. You're good to me. But it's all of us together as a church. Together as a church. Are we gospel givers? Do we give the gospel to people? Do we declare hope to people together? So that when someone in your church is witness to someone else, you come alongside of them and not walk away and be embarrassed that they're doing it and making you feel uncomfortable, but rather go, wow, somebody's talking to somebody about the Lord. Maybe I can just be here and in prayer and, and just join in the conversation as they're doing it. Are we gospel givers to sinners who are lost in life and need to be found? Look at the Pharisees. They murmured at Jesus Christ being around publicans and sinners. Do you murmur? Maybe you wouldn't murmur, you wouldn't criticize, but maybe your murmur has turned into, you know, I don't care. The old apathy thing. Do we as a church come across to people that were apathetic? I'm just asking. I'm not saying we are. I just want to know if we are solely, completely driven and directed by the gospel message to give it to people so that they will come to First Bible Baptist Church and say, wow, you care about souls. Or is it that we just have really good Bible teaching and we really minister to people well, which are all good. We have beautiful music on Sundays together. But it is this, a place where as these Pharisees and scribes murmur, Jesus draws near as they draw near then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Jesus walked through all these challenges. Do we, when somebody rebuffs us and rebukes us and pushes back against our church, will we then stand for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Not for our self-righteousness, I pray that we do. See, we ought to magnify the love and compassion that God the Father has for lost sinners. Mark chapter number 2, verses 13 through 17. I've got highlighted 16 and 17. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? What is the context of this? Well, there's Jesus Christ walking on the seaside, and he called a guy by the name of Levi. What was Levi's occupation? He's a tax collector. How is it that you called him and now you went to his house to sit and eat at his house? When Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We know this to be true within ourselves. We are Bible-believing, Bible-teaching a church. We, we believe in that. But are we gospel givers to those that we adore that are the dirtiest and most difficult sinners in the world, or do we abhor? That's our question before us. You see, Jesus Christ had no discrimination. The Pharisees didn't get it. <laughs> they didn't get it. Luke chapter number 9. You know of this passage. We looked at it a few months ago. Luke 9, verse 51, down through 56. And when his disciples, James and John, I'll pick it up in 54, saw this, they said unto the Lord, Wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? What happened? They went to Samaria, and they got tossed. <laughs> he sent messengers before his face and entered in the village of Samaria to make ready for them, and they did not receive him. That was what happened in verse number 51, 2, and 3. So then what did the disciples say to Jesus? Hey, guess what? We can take care of this problem. We'll have God rain down fire. 
Let's get rid of them all. What does Jesus Christ say? He turned, rebuked them, and he said, you know not what manner of spirit you're of. Come on now, church, let's just check ourselves. For the Son of Man has come to, not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. I understand that this is an oasis for all of you as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. But God forbid if the sinners and publicans that needed Jesus Christ that are lost happen to knock on the doors, not just physically, but spiritually of us, that we would tell them they're too dirty and they need judgment on their lives. It's something to consider together. Do we search, find, and rescue? I know there's people that don't want to be found, but I don't want to be in a place in verses 1 and 2 where I'm the Pharisee and scribes. I'd rather be like Jesus who welcomed the publicans and sinners because it says in verse 3, he spake this parable unto them saying, number 2, search, find, and rescue. Do we restore or ignore the first one was adore and abhor. The second one here is restore. Do we restore or do we, do we ignore? We see restoration going on here. You think of the approach here, 90 and 9. It says there that they didn't need repentance. They're just. There's two approaches that I've heard taught to both. That one is that, hey, the 99, they're good. They've already repented. They already come to know Jesus Christ, and they're part of it, but there's one that wandered off and is lost, and they need to repent and come to Jesus. I've also heard of the other side of it, that they're like the Pharisees, those 99 that just are self-righteous in their way, and they've said, hey, I got my way, I'm good. You see, in this setting, I read uh, up there what it says in the slide, and I want you to focus in on that part. You see, does the church respond as shepherds to the lost sheep who are irresponsible for their faith. Some sheep don't even know that they're lost. There's some people that, I mean, I didn't even know that I had a lost condition in my life. All I knew is that I was a pretty good guy. And then maybe, just maybe, God would be so good to me that he would weigh all my good and bad and he put me in. That was the upbringing that I had. And that's what I was going to go with until someone showed me, as we looked at a few weeks ago, about being lost. Now I take this in this setting here and I ask you, as a church of people, godly people, believers in the Lord, do we have some shepherds around? People that will shepherd people, that will shepherd them to find the lost sheep and go get them. What does a shepherd do? They care for sheep. A sheep is irresponsible for their faith. They don't have a clue. And yet, you want them to pick you right up when you say, here's a Bible verse to remember. Here's a Bible verse. And you memorize all the Bible verses, and they're going, what are you talking about? I'm lost. I don't even know what faith is. Well, do you know faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God? Did you know that? Do you know what I meant? I said it really fast because I don't know what I'm saying. I just want to get out my memory verses. You know, God's love the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the believe in God, the Lord, 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 that you would shepherd people and care for them. That you would tell them that there's none righteous. No, not one. That there's a wage that you will pay for your sin, the Bible says, and the wages of sin is death. Did you know that for by grace are you saved through faith? Not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. 
not of works lest any man should boast. Wow. What you're saying is all the good things that I have done, they're nice things, but they won't assuage the punishment of God for your sin. The Bible says he requires a sacrifice, and his son gave the sacrifice. Would you be willing to believe? See, as a church, I would like us to be in a place where when people out there walk around, come around, they're at ADP Sports, that's one thing. They go to a golf tournament, that's another thing. But what about just First Bible Baptist Church? What do they teach? Well, they good Bible teaching, they're nice people. I have a vision that we would shepherd lost sheep in such a way that they would open up their ears and open up their eyes to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. You say 500 people got saved in Honduras with a team of a few people with translators and all that. What would that be like here? To have a Sunday morning three-hour baptism service for 500 people. I don't know. We may have to break out the pond. Some people might get cholera, but that's okay. I'm just joking. The pond's fine. Matthew 18, the context of Jesus Christ teaching to the disciples about what it means to be great, to be great in his kingdom. Matthew 18 has great context and great teaching of so many different things. And Jesus Christ is saying to his disciples, hey, he said in verse number one, the same time came the disciples into Jesus saying, who's the greatest in the kingdom? So of course he gets into that. He talks about children, except you be converted and become as a little child. And of course he goes into verse number seven, eight, nine, ten. woe unto the world because of the offenses that must needs that offenses come. He's going down and he says in verse number 10, 11, I got up on the screen, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Similar verbiage is found in Luke how think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. So it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. That is a powerful statement. That is, Jesus Christ speaking on behalf of his Father that he doesn't want to let, and want to have anyone not know the salvation of God. John chapter number 10, verses 7 through 21, the context, of course, is Jesus Christ being a shepherd, being the good shepherd. And in verse number 11, pick up this about the hireling. This is those that don't care. Those are the ones that ignore instead of restore. I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep, but he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep or not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. The wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. The false message is everywhere around every corner. You say it has to be the devil made me do it. There is mankind messing up the gospel of Jesus Christ and perverting the truth of Christ and Christ alone to be saved in some other manner. And we as a church do need to stand for the truth. We as a church need to have the doctrine of the gospel settled completely clear because we are to search and to find and to rescue so that there will be joy. When you go back to Luke chapter number 15, you see that statement in verse 5, and when he had found it, he laid it on his shoulders. It's a powerful, powerful picture we know of that shepherd who picks up that sheep and carries it to give it safety and surety and security that love that comes from the shepherd, pictured by the high priest, the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, who holds on to that sheep. And when he cometh home, he called his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. You know the whole thing is the joy of the sheep that was found. 
Again, some sheep don't want to be found. You find them and say, leave me alone. But then there's the other side of that sheep that was found. It's the person that found them. There's incredible joy and rejoicing there. Then there's the third bunch of people. You see it. They're the people that are neighbors and friends, and, 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 and he's saying, hey, rejoice with me. But then there's the fourth bunch, the people that the spiritual setting in heaven. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over the sinner that repenteth. More than ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. We search, we find. What do we do? Do we rescue, do we restore, or do we ignore? There are some I know that are hiding. They don't want to be found. I understand that. But how are you going to find out? How am I going to find out? How is our church going to find out? If there's lost people, as these sheep blowing in the wind, maybe it's unfortunate that we abhor and ignore way too much and we need to kind of grasp that thought of how we adore people that are lost our church adores and restores people oh my it takes an awful lot of love doesn't it lastly to search find and rescue our third piece explore or deplore see how this one comes about follow me here does the church respond as homemakers who lost something they previously valued deeply? The shepherd is going to be a guy. Unless the, the man, the husband of the home, dies, he passes away. And then, of course, those sheep are going to be cared for by a near kinsman, by someone else in the family that is tied together, if no one else can, then they have to make arrange, arrangements because in the culture, the woman is going to care for the home. Vice versa, she's a homemaker, it says here. There's a woman here that is highlighted by Jesus in his coin being lost. She's a homemaker. The guy's not going to be the homemaker unless, of course, he's a widower and then he has to care for things until he has a maid to take care of things or servants. In this culture, very simply is this. Jesus covers, hey guys, hey gals, hey collectively as a church, what are you going to do when the coin is lost? Follow with me here. Does the church respond as homemakers who lost something they previously valued deeply? deeply? What do you mean, pastor? It says there, either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. All those things going through your mind, different preaching messages you heard in this context. Oh, the coin represents us as lost sinners getting stuck in the dirt of this world. That's a good one. I like it. Here's the picture of this woman. It is said that it would be something representative of her dowry, being married to her husband, or it would be this headband that would be around her, and it would have these coins. And each coin represents what? A day's wages. Now, again, give perspective. Oh, that's just a few pennies, a few cents. If you make $52,000 a year, you make $1,000 a week, right? You work five days a week, $200 a day. Now I got you. What if you were going to lose 200? What if you lost $200 a day for the next three days? You would be going crazy. You'd be screaming at your wife, where did you put the money? I didn't do it. You went and bought yourself something. I saw it in the bank card, in the money card. What if you lost one day's wages? $200. Now let's, be re let's make it real here now. What if you make $100,000 a year? That's $400 a day. How is it, though, that as homemakers, this coin was valuable at one time, and now it's lost? How did you lose it? is the question. I'm talking about parents. I'm not talking about the kids because you yell, always blame the kids. How many of you are crazy about looking for things? Raise your hand, please. Three of you, good. How many of you, when you lose something, go, ah, I lost it, why bother, I'll go buy another one? Oh, none of you. 
No, I said, it's a, not a participatory group here this morning. That's okay. My illustration went, Bleh. simply put, follow me now. You know where I'm going because the Holy Spirit is talking to you. What happened to that person that was really valuable to you and you lost track of them? What happened, homemaker, to that coin that represents a life that you used to pray for? Why is it that we devalue over time the lost soul, the lost coin, the lost sheep? Because we as a church are looking to the other person to pick us up. But if we, as three to four hundred people at First Bible, look to the other and look to the other, and we don't, then as a church, people are going to go, obviously you don't value my soul that much. Maybe you did it once when I came to visit before, but, you know, I've hung out with you, and all I hear is you guys just, meh, 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 meh. I sure hope that's not what someone would say. You see, because there's something powerful that went on here as we finish this up. And that she lose, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house. That home did not have any windows. She didn't pull the blinds up. When she found it, she called her friends, neighbors together, rejoice with me. I have found the peace, which I, there's that joy. We joy together. We rejoice together. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. It says in John chapter number 8, Jesus speaking about the light of life in the midst of darkness. These men have brought this woman for adultery. And in the text, when Jesus lifted himself up, saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Had no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. That's what Jesus Christ does. That's when we explore to find the lost person, bring Jesus, and the lost is no longer someone that has got no value, but rather their soul is very, very valuable. Chapter number 9 speaks of Jesus Christ again in the light of the world. Jesus Answered, it says in verse number three up there, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, talking about him healing the blind boy, blind man, that it was blind for all these years, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You and I bring the light of the world. You and I bring the word of God. You and I bring the good news of the gospel. Are we gospel givers? For the lost sinner, are we truly shepherds that see what it takes to go find a lost sheep that has completely lost their way? They're irresponsible with faith. They don't have a clue. Are we at a place where we understand the importance of a homemaker? We're home together, are we not? We're the homemakers saying that, hey, if we lost track of somebody, how is it that we lose track of people? And you say, oh, they must be a Christian and they went to another church. Is that really the way that I'm going to answer that question to you? God, forgive me. It ought not to be that way. We as a church should not lose track of people, especially those that have been wrestling with their faith. They might be, of course, that lost coin. They're lost sheep, whatever it may be. We talked about discipleship and what it'll cost you last week. Now we're looking at, hey, the value of a soul and someone that is lost. Not you, not you, believer, but someone who is lost what perspective does Jesus give to us to have us say we want to rejoice? These are pictures of joy. There's pictures of rejoicing. 
Jesus is saying, hey, if you lost a day's wages, if you lost track of your sheep, what would you do? Church, what will we do? Jesus says, again, it's on the, la on the last slide here. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. If there is rejoicing in glory in the heavenlies, what kind of rejoicing can we have? We can do this too! See, Jesus told us the rejoicing is worth the price of his search and rescue mission. Church, do we need not? <laughs> we do. Do we not need this reminder? We do together. Why don't you stand for a word of prayer? Why don't you bow your heads as I pray with you and pray for you? There's an altar up here to pray. There's the altar of your heart and your seat. But let me pray for you. Let's pray together as a church. Maybe this could be just a church-wide time where we pray and say, hey, Lord, we do need this reminder. Do we not? Do we not need this reminder? Father in heaven, this is time that is really, really special to you right now. Each aspect of the last few minutes, we've got into praising you and praying, and we've got into the word of God and, and taught it according to your direction by the Holy Spirit. Now in the name of Jesus, with this congregation of people, your church, your local church, I pray that you'll work on us, work in us, and that God, we be moved to do business with you. If there's anyone that doesn't know that Jesus can save them and they're lost, they're a lost sheep today, I pray you would tug on their heart, speak to them with conviction. Please, I pray. God, this is an invitation time of prayer. May you be blessed and honored and glorified. In Jesus' name, I pray. As the music plays.